All right, it's time to settle this artificial sweetener debate once and for all. I wanna confirm right here, right now that they do, in fact, affect you. And now that we're done with that, we could get to the real question. Is this effect good, bad, or neutral? Yo, 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 what is up? Welcome back to another week of How to Health. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and longevity and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic manner. Today, we're gonna clear the air and remind each other that every single thing that we consume affects us, interacting with our biology in ways that elicit some sort of unique response, and thus, by definition, affecting the organism, AKA you and me. And this is all validated by a very simple first principle. Everything you do affects you. So assuming this is our premise from here on out, and assuming you're still here and have not been triggered from that opening hot take, we can get to the cool stuff and try and tease out if these effects are beneficial, detrimental, or no biggie. Oh, and we have a juicy new randomized control human study to help us out assessing the effects of some of the most prevalent sweeteners on the market today. But before we get there, we will first touch on what we know and the controversy with these non-nutritive sweeteners, then dive into this new data, finally finishing up with the realest of real analyses on how we can go about navigating these zero calorie sweet thangs, and hopefully have a sweet time throughout. Sweet brah. Okay, I'll stop. On to the controversy, the great sweetener war. This is one of these debates where the two sides seem to be at polar opposites, or at least like many hot topics, the extremes on both ends are being the loudest. Sweeteners have traditionally established their spot in modern day eating as a way to scratch that sugar itch without directly consuming sugar and the energy that comes along with it. So what do we know about their impacts on our health? Well, a good place to start is with what they're replacing, sugar. It has been clear and concise through the literature that excess added sugar consumption is a problem, being associated with some of the top longevity destroying diseases prevalent today, including type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, and longevity liability numero uno, chronic inflammation. And I wanna be clear, we are not talking sugar consumption from real whole foods. We're talking sugar consumption from the ultra processed, additive riddled, emulsifier rich, preservative abundant foods that comprise the majority of the modern day grocery store. It is relatively clear that a diet high in added sugar is not cool for biological school. And we have several deep dives into how it affects things such as mitochondria function, circadian alignment, and inflammation on the fully loaded how to eat playlist link below. Now, with this knowledge, one of the most common strategies for combating obesity and hyperglycemia, AKA high blood sugar, involves dietary sugar replacement with non-nutritive sweeteners. The common ones being saccharin, sucralose, aspartame, asulfane K, and stevia. The majority of that list, with the exception of stevia, being artificial. The longstanding thesis here, especially by our friends at the food companies, is since they do not contain calories, then they are assumed not to elicit a postprandial glycemic response, aka a post-consumption sugar spike. I mean, the theory sure is nice, but things tend to be a tad bit more complicated when it comes to biological interactions. A perfect time to explore what the current data on the topic has to say, huh? Uh, a little bit of everything. Awesome. The good news is, thus far in humans, there have been quite a bit of randomized controlled trials. Some report a beneficial response in metabolic markers when subjects supplemented non-nutritive sweeteners. Others reported neither a beneficial or detrimental effect, only suggesting that they do not support their initial use case. And finally, of course, some counterintuitively suggest that in some contexts, non-nutritive sweeteners may actually contribute to the obesity and diabetes problems. Yikes. Now, if there was a word to remember throughout all this, it would be 
context, a key concept that will be super relevant and we will break down in the conclusion. As you can see, there seem to be valid arguments from all sides. And things get even more controversial when we take into consideration that a lot of these studies associating sweeteners with negative health effects are observational, thus making it difficult to interpret their findings due to something called reverse causality. For example, trying to determine if it is the non-nutritive sweetener that caused the hyperglycemia and the obesity, or it was just people who were hyperglycemic and obese who consume the most non-nutritive sweeteners. This is why human studies are just so much fun. And when it comes to negative effects in randomized controlled trials, most of the data against non-nutritive sweeteners is displayed in animal models, with several high-profile studies highlighting their potential role in modulating the microbiome, or the tens of trillions of microorganisms that live in and on us right here, right now, in a suboptimal way. And because of these mixed results and the pure lack of conclusive evidence on their negative effects in humans, the arguments on both sides continue, simply adding more fuel to the overall debate. Long story short, the scientific jury is still deliberating. And I think it's safe to assume we may be here a while. But as for now, in the absence of strong evidence for causality, and a clear mechanism demonstrating how these substances can affect human metabolism, consumption of sweeteners is still widely endorsed by clinicians and dietitians for adults. And with that, let's check out this new human data and see if it could tell us something that we don't already know. The study, the human study. For this scientific exploration, researchers structured a multi-arm randomized control trial to assess the effects of top non-nutritive sweeteners on metabolic health and the microbiome. The, the microbiome. Seems like they're going for the whole kit and caboodle here, aren't they? And to do this, they screened over 1,300 individuals who strictly avoid non-nutritive sweeteners in their day-to-day -day life, identifying a cohort of 120 individuals in good health to participate in the study. Here, they broke them into six groups, two control groups, and four who ingested well below the FDA daily allowance of either aspartame, saccharin, stevia, or sucralose, while one of the control groups consumed regular sugar and the other consumed no additive at all. Okay, so that's cool. But what did this intervention actually look like? Well, it consisted of three phases over 29 days. The first seven days to baseline measurements of metabolic, metabolomic, and microbial parameters, followed by 14 days of exposure to the various nutritional interventions, aka the sweeteners, and finally seven days after the intervention had stopped to monitor and track measurements. For data collection, participants wore a continuous glucose monitor for the entire 29 days, while glucose tolerance tests, blood draws, and microbiome samples were collected throughout. In addition, participants logged all food intake and physical activity in real time using a smartphone app. Now I gotta say, this structure, pretty well thought out. And they even have a really cool way to try and tease out causality as well. But we'll get to that in a minute. First, what'd they find? The results. Right out the gate, using the glucose tolerance test, they found that saccharin and sucralose significantly impacted glucose tolerance in healthy adults, while aspartame, stevia, and the two control groups did not show any significant effects. Interestingly, both these reductions in glucose tolerance went away when saccharin and sucralose were removed during the seven-day follow-up period indicating that short-term consumption of sucralose and saccharin in doses under the daily recommended guidelines can impact the glycemic response in healthy individuals. Hmm, pretty interesting. Next, researchers took a look at glycemic variability and insulin, using continuous glucose monitors to tease out if any of the additives increase the rate or average glucose spike from baseline during the intervention. Here, they found a higher variability in the saccharin and stevia group, but nothing else significant from the others. And when it comes to insulin, there were only noticeable increases in the glucose-fed glucose control group and the stevia group, which would be expected in the glucose control group, but really interesting to see that stevia stuck out 
from the rest of the bunch there. And throughout all this, data from the activity and nutrient tracking app indicated that there were no significant differences in intake of nutrients or physical activity, which cancels out the potential impact there. Now it's time to move to those creepy crawlers, or what I like to call my internal minions. What about the microbiome? Right off the bat, a significant change in microbiome composition from baseline was found in the saccharin and sucralose groups. But all four non-nutritive sweeteners seem to have an effect on microbiome function, meaning in some way, shape, form, or another affecting their metabolism and the metabolites that they produce. For example, the sucralose groups saw altered purine metabolism, the saccharin groups saw changes in glycolysis and glucose degradation, while the aspartame groups saw modifications in amino acid polyamine metabolism, and the stevia group displayed altered fatty acid biosynthesis. Collectively, these results suggest that non-nutritive sweeteners can impact the functional potential of the human microbiome in a non-nutritive sweetener specific manner, with the most prominent effects on the fecal microbiome observed with sucralose. They also found distinct oral microbiome changes associated with each additive group as well. And again, I gotta say, this is all pretty interesting. And I think it strengthens the arguments that there are distinct effects associated with the consumption of sweeteners. But how do we really know if it's modification of our internal minion army is actually causing this and it's not some other factor or factors that we're just not seeing. Here's where the researchers took this study to the next level. In an attempt to establish causation, they transferred microbial samples from the subjects to germ-free mice, aka mice who have been raised in completely sterile conditions and don't have a microbiome of their own. Think of them as kind of mice bubble boys. Great movie. Here, researchers migrated the microbes of top and bottom responders as it pertains to changes experienced with the sweetener intervention. In other words, the participants who saw the most significant and the least significant or no changes. This way, they were able to cover both extremes. And after doing this, they found in all of the non-nutritive sweetener groups, but in none of the control groups, the recipient mice from top responders developed glycemic issues that very significantly mirrored those of the human donor. And in contrast, the bottom responders' microbiomes were mostly non-responsive, suggesting that the microbiome changes in response to human consumption of non-nutritive sweeteners may at times induce glycemic changes in the consumer via a highly personalized manner. All in all, the researchers concluded, their work provides evidence that commonly consumed non-nutritive sweeteners may not be physiologically neutral in humans like previously thought, with some of their effects mediated indirectly through impacts exerted on reconfiguration of the microbiome. Whew, gotta say, that was a fun one and a little smelly. Now we get back to the real question. What does this really mean? And does this change anything? When it comes down to determining what all of this means for you, ultimately, it probably depends. And at this time, I would like to reacquaint you with that magic word we mentioned earlier, context. Because it is likely the source of truth when it comes to determining an individual's short and long-term response, not only to non-nutritive sweeteners, but to any intervention. Variables like current cellular and metabolic health, microbiome composition and diversity, daily diet, activity levels, sleep quality, environment, stress, inflammation, and a plethora of additional variables end up dictating the response that you, the individual, the organism, experience. In reality, it is highly unlikely that everyone will respond in the exact same way, especially when taking into consider things like the microbiome, which is a living ecosystem influenced by a ton of different variables, not just one. Thus, in my humble opinion, it's just ignorant to say sweeteners are the defining one. The truth is, some people can probably tolerate them rather well or be the bottom responder while others could have a suboptimal biological experience. All this is heavily determined by the context in which the intervention is applied. 
aka the current state of your ecosystem, how you live your life, the things you consume, and the environment you interact with. There's probably a good chance that your ability to tolerate non-nutritive sweeteners safely depends on how well you take care of yourself in all these other aspects. In my view, studies like this act as a great reminder to not get complacent with what you allow into the hottest club in town, aka club circulation and your body. Because like I said before, everything you consume has an impact. With the point in case today, sweeteners. And with them, the good, bad, neutral consensus will continue to play out for years and most likely end up having an individualized, it depends, outcome. So stay educated and humble because we simply just still don't know a lot. As for my strategy here, I like to act on the side of caution and personally do not dabble with non-nutritive sweeteners or any added sugar. Although every once in a while, I will consume an amino acid blend with a little bit of stevia in it. Other than that, as you know by now from all the other videos, I like to keep it simple and focus on real whole nourishing foods in their natural forms. Avoiding the ultra processed, additive, sweetened, emulsified, preserved, colorant, abundant world that has been standardized upon in this modern day. But that's just me. I certainly believe in a world where one can enjoy great tasting real food and be very leisure with sugar in its natural form without having to worry. But as we know, the modern day food landscape is unfortunately working against us. Eating this way doesn't just happen. You have to make it happen. You got to do the work. Up your health literacy, build your routines, and continuously tweak your strategy. It's up to you, the owner of your health, to determine your path and risk tolerance. Because we all are, in fact, different. I just urge you to not leave feeling good each and every damn day on the table. You deserve to experience how the human body is capable of feeling. We all do. So invest and reap the short and long-term health ROI. Oh, and if you need a little help with that, you can join the longevity challenges in Patreon, where we as a group implement sustainable focused longevity change, habit by habit, week by week, focusing on getting healthy from the inside out. If interested, all the links for that will be in the description below. Listen, I know this may have not given you the clear and concise answer you were looking for when it comes to nutritional sweetener consumption. That's simply because, as we just went through, it likely depends. But at least you got a whole bunch of movie references, gifts, memes, and a whole hell of a lot of sarcasm while thinking and forming your own thesis on the topic. Oh, no, no need to thank me. Just doing my job.